Hello? I don't know what that is. Uh, it was one of those uh, guys that called me to buy insurance, I think. I, I don't know. Uh, Luke 8. Open your Bibles to Luke 8. Fella got a job a couple of years ago, and he, he really needed a job, and he got a job as a lumberjack up in Oregon. And who, who he was going to work for, this, this uh, group were really known for being uh, ungodly, just anti-Christian, ungodly folks. And his friend said to him, said, you know, well, I'm glad you got the job, but I'd see you go work there because uh, those guys are going to really ridicule you and persecute you because they're, they're about as unchristlike as anybody you could ever meet. And the guy went off and, you know, lumberjacks, they go just live in the woods for months, cutting trees. And finally, after about six or eight months, he came home and he bumped into his friend. And his friend said, how's it going? He said, it's going pretty well. He said, are are they really giving you a hard time because you're a Christian? And the man said, no, not at all. He said, in fact, they haven't even found out yet. That's what our lesson's about today. Somebody said to me one time, said, you know, I think in our country it's going to uh, come to the time where it's going to be a crime to be a Christian, that you could actually be arrested for being a Christian. And I said to him, I said, well, don't you worry about that. I don't think there's enough evidence against you to convict you. <laughs> Luke 8, chapter 16, or chapter 8, verse 16. No one when he is lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed but sets it on a lampstand that those who enter may see the light. That verse is actually telling us that, you know, it would be so foolish for a person to light a lamp in order that you might see what's going on in the room and then put a bowl over the lamp. I I, I realize in the King James Version it says no man lights a candle. In biblical times they didn't use candles. They they used lamps. And what the the lamp was was just a saucer of oil with uh, a wick in it. Around Christmas time when our Jewish friends celebrate Hanukkah, they have a menorah, you know, with the candlesticks and the eight candlesticks, and the nine, nine candlesticks. And, and to be honest with you, in the temple, it wasn't candlesticks. It was saucers of oil with wicks. And, and they had enough oil for nine days. And, and no one would take a saucer of oil, a lamp in that day, and light it, the Bible says in this verse, and and cover it with a vessel. The word vessel there is, is actually, we would probably translate that, it, it, was a, it was a measuring bowl. It was a clay measuring bowl that, that held about what we would call a peck. Uh, how, you know, we sing this little light of mine and we hide it under a bushel. No. But this is a peck. And, and why would you light a lamp and put it under a bowl? Well, the, the light would go out. You, you, would, you would douse the light. And he says, nor does a man put it under a bed. And if we understand biblical times, we understand that that he's talking about that reclining couch, the lazy boy of of the Jews' day. The reclining couch on which they ate their meals. And and you light a lamp so that you might see what you're eating. Now, in some restaurants today, they dim the lights because they don't want you to see what you're eating. They just want you to guess. But but you, you wouldn't light a lamp and put it under your recliner under your table we went out to eat with some friends the other night they invited us to our home and and uh had a beautiful table setting with candles and i took one and put it under my chair no i didn't you wouldn't do that why why wouldn't you do that catch a chair on fire burn the house down so no man would do that but he sets it on a lampstand. 
And, and the lampstand of the day was, was nothing more. Most of the homes of that day were just one room. And, and we call them a flat. You know, kitchen, living room, bedroom, all in one room. And as they built those little homes, they would, they would have rocks protruding out of the wall. And the purpose of those wall, rocks protruding out of the wall was so that they might set their lamps on those. And no man would put it under his lamp under the bed. No man would put his lamp uh, under a bowl. You put it on the protrusion out of the wall, on the lampstand, so that it would light up the whole room. He says that so that those who enter in might see the light. And, and, and they, they might know where the furniture is so they won't fall. I read a story this week about a man who was, was blind and he was sitting beside uh, 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 buildings on, on the sidewalk and he had a candle. And, and someone asked him, said, man, that's kind of foolish, isn't it? Here you are, you're blind, you're, you're begging for money. Why do you have the candle? You can't see. And he says, I have the candle so that others can see me. I don't want people stumbling over me. And so a light is, is lit so that people might see. Then the next verse says this, For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. You see, this little parable is an extension of the parable of the soils. Remember that, Remember that uh, message last week? We have a different kind of heart. Some of us have, have this trampled heart, hard heart. And, and some of us have a thorny heart. And some of us, you know, have a rocky heart. And some of us have a good heart. It's an extension. And, and you, the disciple said, why do you talk in parables? And Jesus said, it's been given to you to understand and if you will listen carefully, the Holy Spirit will turn on the light of my word. And that which is told to you in secret will be made public. When I think of that, I think of, of what Dr. Brown used to say to the preacher boys at John Brown University. He used to say, listen, here's, here's your objective. You need to learn something every week. Get into the Word of God and learn something. And then on Sunday morning, get up and share what you've learned. See, what you've learned in secret, you need to go out and share in the open what you've learned. When God has blessed you in the secret, you need to share that blessing with other people out in the open. And that's really what this means. God did not give the gospel of his son to be secret and to be a hidden treasure to us. He gave it to us to go out and share. Some of us, I think some churches ought to be named Smots Churches. Secret meeting of the saints. We don't invite lost people to come. We don't tell lost people what we're doing. We don't tell lost people about our Bible study or, or what we read. And you know, I, God has opened a door for me. I've been trying to witness to my neighbors for, for years. And finally, God has shown me how to do that. I read good books and then I give them to my neighbors and they read them. And then they bring them back. And last night, about 8 o'clock, I knock on the door and a guy come, my neighbor come over. And, and he said, hey, listen, I'm returning. This, this was a good book. He said, in fact, it was so good, I went and bought five copies and gave them to my friends. Got any more? You see, what, what I enjoy spiritually and what God blesses me with, if I share that, God expands that. And he takes it out. And that's what that verse really means. Therefore, take heed how you hear. Now, Mark puts it another way. When Mark's telling this story, Mark says, take heed what you hear. I think both of them are good, good uh, suggestions. You and I need to be careful of what we're listening to. Let's talk about music, if we will. We, we, we uh, most of us in here are old. The younger folks come in the next session, and they listen to that lousy rock and roll music, that ugly music. Not us. We listen to that country music where people are cheating on people, and they're drinking, and, they're, and, 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 you know, and their, their wives are leaving them and all of that. Do you know what? You listen to that stuff and you begin, that begins to be your philosophy. 
We need to be careful what we read. We need to be careful what we listen to. But it means something more than that. It means this. Listen, when the preacher's preaching, we need to pay attention. We need to come to church and say, Lord, I'm going to clear my mind of all of my worries and all of my cares and all of the things I'm thinking about. And, and I'm trying to sell my house. I'm trying to get my car fixed, trying to get my kids through. I'm clearing my mind of all that. And you have a man up there that studied the word of God all this week. And he's going to present to me a message. And Lord, I want to hear it. Help me to pay attention. You see, I believe this verse says, therefore, pay attention. To what is being said to you. My mama used to say, do you hear me? Well, I'll tell you what she had said so loud. I believe Helen Keller could have heard her. You know? Of course I hear you. Isn't that funny what parents say to their children? Here's one that I never answered because I knew I'd die if I did. Do I look stupid? <laughs> eh. The next verse says, for whoever has, to him more will be given. Whoever does not have, even what he seems to have will be taken from him. I've always thought that was a harsh verse until this week. And, and boy, I've really poured over the scripture a lot this week. And, and you know what it's talking about? If you put it in context, what it's talking about is those people who have a grasp on the Word of God will be further enlightened about the Word of God. You see, those people who take their Bible reading seriously, uh, it, it's not just a, a little thing that you do on, in the mornings in order that you might have a good day and, and you do it as a good luck charm, but they actually take their morning Bible readings or their evening Bible reading seriously. And, and they meditate upon the word that they read. And they say, God, show me what you want me to do here. Do you know what? They're going to, they're going to receive more and more. In fact, they're going to be enlightened. And God's going to lead them to different verses and different areas. And they're actually going to understand some words. But people will say to me, well, you know, I read the Bible and I don't understand it. Well, pay attention. Slow down. In one of my older commentaries, there's a story of a, a slave back in, uh, when, when, when there were slaves back in the South, and she had become a Christian. And, and the, the person, her master or the plantation owner, whatever you call him, he, he was a Christian. But this slave who could barely read understood the word of God much better than her owner who was well educated and one day he said to her he said how is it that you understand the bible so much better than i do and she says simple she said you read it so easily i have to think about every word what does that mean why is it there and you know what, what she was actually doing? She was meditating. When I, when I was young, I remember that, I was. In elementary school, I think every year they wanted to hold me back. Some of them wanted to just get rid of me. But they want to hold me back. I, I was slow, had difficult time with, with my studies through... through uh, Junior high, I, w I was slow. Love to love to read. I, I in junior high, I uh, read uh, what they call in Oklahoma less miserables, La Miserable. I read that. Man, that's a that's a big book. I, and I enjoyed that, but I was really slow. And then I became a Christian. And someone said when he became a Christian, he started making straight A's. You know, no, that's not true. What happened was. When I became a Christian, how I became a Christian was by memorizing the Word of God and quizzing over the Word of God. So I had to meditate on the Word of God. I had to learn how to meditate. And, and, and what God did for me when I became a Christian, he said, okay, that's how you learn history. That's how you learn math. You, you don't just read words. You 
meditate on them. Well, I didn't use the word meditate. You actually pay attention. You think about it. Now, don't tell Margie I told you this, but, but Margie's much smarter than me, has a higher IQ. And, uh, but when I married her, she was in trouble. She had a full scholarship to college, but she was in trouble because she was making lousy grades. And uh, she and I talked about that, and we couldn't afford to lose that scholarship. She needed to go to school. And, and I said, Marge, what's the problem is you haven't been taught how to study. So my job as a husband, my first job as a husband and my wife was to teach her how to study. And, and I became a father real quick. I said, you get to watch 30 minutes of television an evening, and then you have to outline your history book. And, and, and we begin to teach her. But you see, what we were really doing is we were learning how to concentrate, how to meditate, how to pay attention to what we were reading. Don't you just think, folks, that just because you're reading the Bible, the Holy Spirit's just going to bam, and you're going to have a new truth. That's not the way it works. God wants you to dig out the nuggets of his word because if you dig them out yourself, they're going to be yours and not the preacher's or the person who wrote the devotional book. You understand that? If we, pray proper, if we pay pro proper attention to the Lord's teaching, it'll become clear to us. That's what this verse is saying. Well, here's my sermon. Ready? I, I want you to understand the message. But here's, here's what I really want you to understand about this message. First of all, I want you to understand that God is the light. Listen to this. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 5, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare unto you, that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. God is light. And in the fullest sense of, of the definition, the word of God is light. In the fullest sense of the definition, the word of God is the revelation of God. It is written in scripture. So we have the light. And the Bible says that this, thy word is a light unto my path, a lamp unto my feet. So when you're reading the Bible, you're at, it's like turning on the switch. Here's the Bible. I've opened it up. I've turned on the switch. And, and the word of God, the light has been given to us by God because all scripture, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We can walk in the light. Jesus is the light. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5 that Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and he that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I hope you grasp this today, that when the Bible says that I am the light, once again the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, you are the light. Well, I can't be the light in the same way that God is the light. I can't be the light the same way the word of God is the light. And I can't be the light the same way that, that Jesus is the light. They, I mean, they are the source of light. Light emanates from them. So how am I the light? When I received Jesus Christ as my Savior, the Holy Spirit came to live in me. And now the reason, the way I am the light is that the light shines through me. You, you see, Jack Taylor wrote a book years ago, said Christianity is really Christ in unity. And when people see us, they ought to see Christ. Paul said, my philosophy is this. He said, it's not I that live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let your light shine. Let Jesus shine in you. Now, if you understand that, you're going to understand this. It is not up to you to fill the saucer with oil. It is not up to you to trim the wick. It is not up for you to light 
the wick. That's all up to God. All you do is just let Jesus shine through you. As you read the word of God, as you fellowship with believers, as you witness, you just let Jesus shine through you. That's the reason our verse is so important. You shall be my witnesses under the uttermost part of the earth. What does that mean? Wherever we go, Jesus is going to shine through us. F.B. Meyer tells the story of a, a man who came to him and and this man said, uh, Dr. Meyer said, I'm, I'm really excited. Tomorrow night, I've invited a fellow worker to come to the meetings. And he said, let me tell you an interesting story. I invited him to come, and, and I, I said, listen, we have this great Bible preacher at our church, and I'd like for you to come and hear him. How about going with me on Tuesday night? And the man said, are you a Christian? He said, oh, yes, I'm a Christian. He said, well, I am too, and I'll come. And this man said to Dr. Meyer, said, isn't that funny? We've been working together for five years, and we didn't even know one another were Christians. F.B. Meyer said, it's not funny. You both need to be born again. How can you be a Christian and work side by side with someone for five years, and they not know you are a Christian? Over, over my years of ministry, I've had women come to me and say, well, uh, uh, would you pray for my husband? And I'll say, well, is he a Christian? Well, I, I don't know. How long have you been married? Well, our children are 14, 15. And you don't know? Well, evidently he's not. Does he know you are? I'll tell you what, that's a sad thing, isn't it? One of, the, one of the sorriest times in my life, Margie and I, and this was B.C., before children, <laughs> we'd gone to bed one evening, and, and Margie was crying. I just hate that when women do that. Because you're going to ask, what's the matter? And they're going to say, I don't know. Of course, my response is, well, get over it then. <laughs> or when you find out, let me know. But she didn't say that. I said, what's wrong? She said, I don't know if you're a Christian or not. What? I'm the preacher. I preach every Sunday morning. I go visit hospitals. I bury people. I marry people. I read the Bible. You don't know. She said, the way you act around the house, I don't know. You see, the, the different, and boy, I tell you what, that really hit me. I got out of bed immediately, got on my knees, and I said, Lord, if my wife doesn't know I'm a Christian, no one else does either. What was I doing? I was hiding. I had put out the light of my Christian faith. I want to talk about that a little bit more a little bit later. But listen, do, do the people you live next to, do they know you're a Christian? You say, well, preacher, you know our neighborhoods today, we don't even really know our neighbors. Well, I'll tell you what, that's not their fault. Bake them some banana bread and take them over there. They will learn your name real quick if, you, if you're a good cook. Don't bake it if you're not, though. <laughs> Go get some fried chicken or something and take it over. But get to know them. You see, that's what we are. God placed you in that neighborhood. That's the second point of my sermon. God is the light. But, but God shines through you. And here's what God, and God puts the light and puts you as his light where he wants you to be. Not necessarily where you want to be, but where he wants you to be. You see, those people in those little homes, they had those little protrusions out of the wall, and, and they would set the lamp on the side of the wall that they wanted it on that would lighten the part of the room best that they wanted lit at a certain time. 
And God has you living in the neighborhood, working at the place, and doing the things that you are doing, involved with the people that you're involved with for a reason. He has placed you there as his light. And rather than you grumbling and complaining and, 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 and just being miserable all the time, you ought to start saying, God, why have you put me here? You say, would that work everywhere? Many of you remember years ago that I walked out of the church building and there was a dog out there and, and the dog attacked me and, and I've got scars all up and down my arm where the, where the dog broke several bones and crushed my wrist and I had to go to hand therapy for a year. And, and there were many times, well, God, why? Why this? And I would go to this hand therapy and I would go two or three times a week at the beginning and then once a week and then once a month. But, but I went over for, for a period of about eight months. Same lady would hold my hand every week and work my hand. Hurt me. She called me a baby. But she was mean. Before the hand therapy was over, we baptized her. Before she moved back to Florida, we baptized her two daughters. Before her husband died, he received Christ. You say, well, why did God allow that dog to attack you? He needed a light down there in a hand therapy place. And he sent me there to be the light. Wouldn't it have been a shame if I'd have went down there and complained about how God didn't take care of me? Here, I've given my life to God, and he lets a dog attack me, and I'm down here. Wouldn't it have been a shame? There would have been four people who never know Christ. You see, God places us where he wants us to be. You may wonder why God has kind of kept you in a place of obscurity. And you say, I don't have as many opportunities, preacher, as you have to share. But the place where God has placed you is a place that needs light and God has said you're going to be the light in this neighborhood you're going to be the light at this place of business that's what you're going to do you may become discouraged but if you're if you have the Lord Jesus Christ living in you and you pay attention to the word of God and you meditate upon it, you will shine for Jesus. And someday you'll look back and say, oh, that's the why we lost our house and had to move over to this apartment. Or that's why this thing happened or that thing happened. Sometimes God does things in our lives to move us around because we just won't move if he doesn't. God wants you to walk in the light. Ephesians 5, 8 says, You were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Listen to that. You were once in darkness. You were once in dark. You weren't dark, but you were in darkness. And now you are light. Do you understand that? That old sinner that once didn't know, didn't know how to be good is now good. You are light. And then he adds this, so walk as children of light. Hey, you have Christ living in you. Walk like you do. Walk like you do. I, I'm, I, I really get perplexed sometimes with, with folks who, who just want to come to me and say, boy, God wants to heal you, and God wants to take care of you, and you just need to have the faith, and he will heal you. I, I believe God can do that. I, I really do, and only God can do that. But let me tell you what, I, I would feel much better to have people come to me and say, boy, God wants me to shine for him. God wants me to be the witness, and God lives inside me, and I'm just going to turn loose. I'm just going to surrender to him, and I'm going to let him speak through me, sing through me, walk through me. I'm going to let God be me. You see, that's what Christianity is. All this other stuff is about me. It's, Christianity is about him. And that's what this message is. 
You see, we go around and we, we carry baskets with us. Christians carry baskets with us. And what do we do with those baskets, those bowls? We cover our light. You, you say, well, how do we do that? We, we cover our light through worry. Do you know what? If you're worrying about something, you're assuming a responsibility that God never intended for you to have. God said, cast your cares on me. I care for you. We, we, we can douse the light of Christ in our life through worry. We can douse the light of Christ through, in our life through anger. We can douse the light of Christ through bitterness. We can douse the light of Christ through disobedience to his word. We, we can douse the light of Christ through laziness. You understand that? I have notes in my Bible written when I had good eyes. And, and, and I think these notes, I, I didn't write who I got these notes from, but I think I went to a John Maxwell seminar. John Maxwell is a, a Christian and kind of a positive thinking guy, inspirational speaker. And when he dealt with these verses, he said this. He said, the vessel... In this passage, let it speak to the businessman, Brother Steve. You're a businessman. Let it speak to the businessman. And, and, and he says, and what God is saying to the businessman is never let your business blot out your witness. And otherwise, what he says, he says, let your business be a way in which you can shine for Jesus. That would go well for employees too. Never let your work or the work that you do blot out your witness. But use your work and the way you work to shine for Jesus. Once again, F.B. Myers tell, tells a story of a, um, he was witnessing to a man and, and, and he, he knew another man that worked in the same office and he said, do you know so-and-so? He's a Christian. And the guy said, yeah, I know him. He's lazy. He doesn't hold up his end of the job. What did that guy done? He had blotted out his witness through his laziness, his slothfulness. Then, then he said this, he said, the, the, the bed here speaks of a, a life of, of uh, ease. We need to put forth an effort if we're going to be good witnesses. I, I, I've said this to you many times, but I'll say it again today. Witnessing is something that you intend to do. It's not something that just happens. When you go shopping, you go with the intention of sharing Jesus if the opportunity presents itself. Now, I, I don't believe in buttonhole bennies, shoving cards and tracks in front of people's faces just because I've got tracks in my hand. I just don't believe in that. I reject that. I wouldn't accept that. If you shut one in my hand, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that at all. But i tell you what I believe witnessing is. Witnessing is saying, Lord, I've got the tracks. Show me somebody that has soil that has been prepared to receive it. Let me speak a kind word to them. Let them receive this in, in such a fashion that they will read it. You see, I believe in track ministry. I can't always carry cards and tracks in my pocket, but I don't just go hand them out. You see, it's an intentional thing. It, you put forth an effort to do that. Margie and I were buying a lawnmower a few years ago at Sears. And we were asking this guy all about this lawnmower, and there was this young couple standing there. And uh, they were listening, because they wanted a lawnmower too, and so they were, they were listening in on our dime. And uh, I turned to the guy and I said, you, you looking for a lawnmower? He said, yeah. He said, are you going to buy that one? I said, I don't know. Are you? He said, well, if you will, I will. But man, that's no way to buy a lawnmower. But we got to laughing about that. And then I said, 
Do you go to church? He said, no, but I probably should. I said, yeah, you probably need to go to church more than you need a lawnmower. And he laughed about that. I invited him to come to our church. He never came. But you know what? I went to Sears to buy a lawnmower, but I also went to Sears with the intention of, Lord, if you open the door, I'm going to say something. You see? That's what this is all about. That, that's what that little song is about, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Let's stand and sing that song. That's a kid's song, but let's stand and sing that song. Let's sing it together. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Won't let Satan, won't let Satan blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Won't let Satan blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This little light, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Have a seat. I'm going to now. That was to all of you who were believers. God is the light. God gave you the light. God wants the light to shine. He doesn't want you to hide the light. And you say, well, that's good. I hope they listen to that. For those of you who haven't received the light, here's my sermon to you, or here's God's word to you. And it comes from John chapter 1. Beginning with verse 3, talking about Jesus. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Listen to this. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not the darkness didn't overcome it let me tell you something if you are not in the light you are in the dark or what the bible calls the darkness if you are not in christ you are in satan you say you're kidding me you say I'm, that's what the bible says you're either in christ in the light are you in Satan in the darkness? Listen to what it says. But as many as received him, they received the light, to them gave he the power to become the children of God, even to those that believe on his name. So how do we have the light of Jesus come into our lives? Very simple. We first of all believe that we're in darkness. You say, preacher, I, I, I'm glad you said you were talking to believers because I didn't understand anything that you said. You know, the carnal man can't understand spiritual things. But you did understand this, that you're in darkness. That you're a sinner. That Satan is in control of your life. No one in here is in control of his own life. No one in here is his own master. You're either mastered by Satan or you're mastered by Christ. How do you move out of the darkness? You believe that Jesus is the light. 
that he is the creator of all things. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made. And you believe that he is the light, that he is God, come down to earth, and you surrender to him. Lord, I believe you are the light. I want to learn of you. I want to follow you. That's how you step in the light. It's just that easy. And then back to you Christians. Some of you say, well, you know, I haven't been a Christian very long. So I, I, I need to wait till I witness. When does a candle begin to shine? The moment you light it. If you know Jesus, you say, well, I don't know the scriptures very well. Well, if you know Jesus, the light is in you. Be the light that you are. Of course, you may not be as bright or some other light. But, that, but here's the thing. If you don't know Jesus, it's just like stepping out of a deep, dark cave into the sunlight. Just take that step of faith and say, Lord, I believe that you're the Son of God who died for my sins, was buried, and rose again. And if you've never done that today, will you come do it now? As we sing another song, will you come? And then maybe some of you Christians need to come and say, Lord, I, I need to be a better light where I work, where I live. Help me to meditate on your word. Help me to pay attention to what you say so that I can shine brightly for you. Let's stand. Will you come today? If you want to receive Christ as your Savior, you come and let Brother Terry, Brother Steve pray with you. They'll show you how you can know that you know Jesus is your Savior. Will you come as we sing? The whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. The light of the world is Jesus. Like sunshine and noonday, His glory shone in. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, is shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. No darkness have we who in Jesus abide. The light of the world is Jesus. We walk in the light when we follow our guide. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, is shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. Us. Ye dwellers in darkness with sin-blinded eyes, the light of the world is Jesus. Go wash at his bidding and light will arise. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, is shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. No Amen. Need. Okay, thank you. That's an old song. You can be seated. That's a good old song. We found that in the 1958 Baptist hymnal. And uh, it was amazing this week, Brother Warren. A lady called me this week. Uh, she may be in church today. I doubt it, though. <coughs> do you sing? Do you have a piano when you sing? Yes, ma'am. You got drums? Well, sometimes. Do you sing hymns? Yeah. We sing good music, ma'am. Do you sing hymns out of Baptist hymnal? I said, ma'am, I don't think you're really going to be happy at our church. She said, do you use a hymn book? I said, ma'am, we, we use a screen. We sing hymns, but we sing other songs. 
Do you sing out a Baptist hymnal? I didn't know until this week that God had inspired that hymnal. So we went and found the 1958, and we sang one for that lady, although she's probably not here. But uh, I like those old songs. We, we do, every time they make a hymnal, they take my good songs out and put new ones in. But we go back and find them. He has to, if you have an old Baptist hymnal that's before 1958, bring it, because there's some songs in there I like to sing too. Uh, the, the idea here is this, that we worship God. And you know, nowhere in the world, and nowhere in the word, does it say God blessed this decade of music, or music that is printed in this way. You know what, we sing from our hearts, not from a book. Or not from a screen. And, and we only want to sing good music. And praise God, we got a music director that teaches us new songs and also lets us keep the old songs and sings those with us. We thank God for that. Brother Terry, do you have anything to tell us? No? Okay. Brother Steve, you have anything? Okay. Let's stand and be dismissed. Father, we thank you for this day. God bless us as we go. Let us be light shining for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Don't forget the work day this coming Saturday. Come join us as we beautify the campus. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no. I'm gonna let it shine Hide it under a bushel No, I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine, let it shine Let it shine